Good afternoon. Welcome to the 2021 Summit on Race Matters in West Virginia, hosted by the Greater Canal Valley Foundation, where I happen to have the best job in town as the president and CEO of the foundation. Thank you so much for zooming in today. As many of you know, the foundation hosted a 2020 series, uh, Summit on Race Matters series. Um, it was a six session series featuring the leading voices on race from, uh, from around the nation. Included people like Ibram X. Kendi, Nicole Hannah-Jones, Angela Davis, Michael Eric Dyson, as well as local um, experts, uh, Kitty Dooley, Reverend Watts, and many more. Last year's focus was on raising awareness about systemic racism and racial disparities in criminal justice, health, education, employment, housing, and wealth, as well as the importance of civic engagement. A compendium of that 2020 series is available on our website now. This year, we are moving from awareness to action. Through the generosity of our donors, our foundation, we, we started working on ourselves, and our foundation has dedicated additional resources to organi organizations that serve diverse populations. We are particularly excited about the return of inroads to Charleston through a partnership with uh, Step by Step. Stay tuned, you'll hear more about this initiative in the coming months. Today, we have assembled two panels of leaders who will speak to actions they have taken within their respective organizations to address diversity, equity, and inclusion. These leaders were invited to the conversation today, not because they are experts in race issues. Rather, they were invited because their organizations are taking action on matters of race. Next up, you'll hear greetings from our, from our board chair at the foundation, Susan Shoemate. Susan will be followed by Reverend Wano English, who will share some reflections on the 2020 summit and what we have envisioned for today. I am Susan Shoemate. I am the chair of the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation Board. The Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation Board members are Bob Orders, Sean Mayberry, Dickinson Gold, Todd Mount, Will Carter, Jason Castle, Deborah Sullivan, Charlie Loeb, Ted Armbrecht, Georgette George, Debbie Sink, and Dale Clouser. On behalf of the Board of Trustees, I would like to welcome, welcome you to the Summit on Race Matters final session, Moving from Awareness to Action. Today we will listen to many of our business and community leaders speak on their organization's commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I want to thank our speakers and panelists for being here today. Last year, the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation hosted the Summit on Race Matters. National and local speakers informed us on education, housing, legal, financial, and health issues facing minorities in Appalachia and nationwide. The summit was an ongoing effort to promote conversation, raise awareness, and strengthen our communities. I want to thank Michelle Foster, our CEO, and our committee and her committee for organizing the summit on race matters last year and the wrap-up of this series today. The Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation was founded in 1962 to help individuals, families, businesses, and nonprofits involve, improve lives within the community. The Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation ranks in the largest 100 community foundations in the nation and concentrates its services in a six county area, including Boone, Clay, Fayette, Kanawha, Lincoln, and Putnam counties in West Virginia. In 2020, the Greater Kanawha Valley Foundation was able to distribute over $13 million in grants and scholarships in our six county and state area. Our main focus areas were health, education, and economic development. This would not be possible without our amazing staff, the volunteers in both distributions and scholarship, and incredibly generous donors. Thank you for all of your help, and we look forward to you joining us today.
evening. My name is Ronald English, and I'm privileged to be uh, the one to make a comment of transition from last year, Grace Matters, to where we are now in terms of how last year raised the awareness of the reality of racism in our society and how it is woven into the very fabric of our American pageantry from the time that it was founded. After understanding where we came from and how that issue needs to be addressed, the next step is moving from awareness to action, which is where this Race Matters Summit, which I would like to call for this purpose Race Matters 2.0, has developed its agenda. And Race Matters 2.0, We'll move from where we heard from scholars in terms of their research and their analysis of the problem to now hear from the practitioners and from those who are in the position of implementing part of what we have learned to make a difference. And that is really what comes from the soul of the executive director of the Kanawha Valley Foundation and the inspiration that came to her from what I believe was a spiritual resource and awakening because the foundation set a path not for being the money resource but to actually be the resource for making a difference. And that is what has been the profound uniqueness of the Kanawha Valley Foundation in sponsoring these Race Matters events. And so we look forward to hearing the sights and insights that on the applications that will fundamentally ask, answer three basic questions of what's up, what now, what next? What's up, what now, what next? in terms of the action and the application of what has been revealed in what we have heard from the scholars and from Race Matters 1. Secondly, it would help us to understand that we are in a situation where uh, the saying of the proof is in the pudding is taking on a different meaning. Because the proof in the pudding really means what's in the recipe of the pudding that changes the taste of the pudding that makes it acceptable to swallow or to digest. And the fact of the matter is that there are recipes in the formula of the pudding that has not tasted good. In fact, it has reflected the poison in the formula of the pudding. So therefore, when we talk about applications, we are talking about what will improve not only the taste, but the nutrition that comes from the transformation of that formula as represented in the application that we are going to hear about from those that have taken that formula, uh, the charge of that formula seriously. I end with the wisdom of two of my mentors and two of the spiritual geniuses of our age. One is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The other is Maya Angelou. The last book that Dr. King wrote was one that raised a question that we are still wrestling with today. And that is, where do we go from here? Chaos or community? We are still struggling to answer that question because the intensity of the chaos magnifies our need and quest and connection in community. Secondly, Maya, spiritual genius, was one who caused her to be a consultant to both Dr. King and Malcolm X. That's because she was grounded in a spirit that was so magnificent and magnanimous that it had that kind of effect. 
And one of the things that Maya said that affects where we are now, she said, when we know better, we do better. So the focus of this conference and the focus of Race Matters 2.0 is that if we know better, then how are we making applications to do better? And how that difference will make a difference that makes a difference. Thank you. After that, I just feel like saying amen. I don't know, it just kind of came over me there. Thank you, Reverend English, and thank you, Susan. It's now time for our panels. We'll have two panels, and it's my pleasure today to introduce our moderators. We have attorney Kitty Dooley, who's the principal at the Kitty Dooley, the Dooley Law Firm, and attorney Tom Haywood, managing partner of Bowles Rice. I'll leave you in their capable hands. Good afternoon, I'm Kitty Dooley, and I want to welcome you all here. It's my pleasure to let you all know that we're going to hear from each panelist. They're going to discuss initially the work that they're doing in their respective companies and organizations. And I really want to take the time to thank them for being here to share with our entire community the work that they are trying to do within their companies to make a difference. And many times these conversations are held behind closed doors and the, the greater community is not aware of it. But they've decided today to come to let everyone know what's going on inside their organizations. And we're really looking forward to hearing from each of them. Tom? Kitty, thank you very much. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist this afternoon representing the public utility sector is Chris Beam, who is President and Chief Operating Officer of American Electric Power. Chris? Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Kitty. And, and thank the Foundation for having us here today. Um, you know, it's been nearly six years ago in August of 1963 that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his powerful I Have a Dream speech. He said, I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident and that all men are created equal. Those are incredibly powerful words then as they are today. However, despite the accomplishments of the civil rights movement, this past year has proved that the dream has not been fully realized. Prejudice and equality persist in the United States. Appalachian Power and our parent company, American Electric Power, believe diversity, equality, and inclusion are critical pieces of our company culture. We're committed to building a work environment where our team members feel valued and supported. As part of our racial and social justice movement over the past year, we've accelerated our diversity and inclusion strategy with employee activities that include town hall meetings, safe space conversations, and video conferences with our African American leaders, and unfortunately video because of the pandemic. We also introduced a new philanthropic initiative, the AEP Foundation, which Appalachian Power funds, created the Delivering on a Dream, a social and racial justice grant program designed to address the systematic racism and injustices in our communities. This five-year, $5 million effort put, puts words into action by funding organizations with programs dedicated to empowering equality for our customers and our neighbors of color. On June 30th, I had the pleasure of presenting one of the first of these Delivering on a Dream grants, $250,000 grant to the Bluefield State College to support their STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math education for minority, underserved, and underrepresented students. This gift was part of $1 million in grants given to four historically black colleges and universities. Of course, Bluefield State College that I mentioned, Southern, Southern University in Shreveport, Louisiana, Jarvis Christian College, and Wiley College. As an energy company, Appalachian Power knows STEM fields not only offer rewarding career opportunities, but also these jobs are essential to delivering the clean, reliable, and affordable energy our customers rely on on a daily basis. This Delivering on a Dream grant from the foundation will enable Bluefield State to expand their STEM programming, create more opportunities for minority students to excel in school and beyond. We do believe actions speak louder than words to ensure justice and equality for our customers and employees of color. 
Now more than ever, we're committed to working together with the communities we serve to help make Dr. Martin Luther King's dream a reality. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much, Chris. And now I'd like to introduce Felicia Bush, the founder and CEO of Harmony Mental Health, which we know is a very, very important topic these days. Thank you so much. Thank you. Harmony Mental Health is a female-founded, African-American, family-run, nonprofit mental health and social services agency. Harmony's board of director is directors is representative of the, of the diversity we strive for in our agency. Harmony staff represents multi-ethnicities, religions, languages, cultural backgrounds, skin colors, sexual orientations, and political views. 81% of Harmony staff identify as female, while 19% identify as male. 53% of the Harmony team are people of color, and 47% are Caucasian. Our staff includes individuals with disabilities, members of the LGBTQ plus community, and one wonderful dreamer. Diversity, equity, and inclusion has been critically important to me personally as a black woman raising black children in a society systemically designed to limit their access to wealth and which poses real danger to their physical safety, both by action and inaction. It is important to Harmony as a corporation but because it is simply part of our corporate DNA. It is the basis on which Harmony was founded. When my daughter and I created Harmony, it was out of the need to provide a safe place for ourselves and others where we could attempt to pursue and implement our own vision of social justice that was free from the ingrained systemic barriers that inhibit individual growth and success. But before Harmony could move forward from awareness to action, I had some work to do on me. And that included letting go of the idea that people will naturally do what is in the common good and understanding that for many, common is limited to looks, thinks, and acts like me. And understanding that for those people, uncommon meant not as good, not as important, not as worthy as me. That is hard when it involves people that you thought you knew. On a personal and an agency level, the events of the past few years revealed how little we really understood about how deeply rooted racism is. We discovered that it was among us, alive and well in our self-created safe space. It was silencing the others, it was judging the people we serve, and it was acting in opposition of our mission. At Harmony, we consider ourselves a team. Hashtag Team Harmony is what you'll often hear us say. And while there's no I in team, we understand that the lived experience, biases, perceptions, and capacity for change of each individual member of our team shapes our collective identity. That understanding required us to stop talking about racism and begin rooting it out. We made a commitment to up the ante on awareness activities by talking about what was happening in the national news and discussing as a group its impact on our lives. We decided to stop making it so comfortable for racism and apathy to hide among us while dictating how we expressed ourselves in our own space. We've begun that work by taking some specific actions, uh, immediately addressing incidents of racism in the workplace, providing training on a multitude of issues and specifically addressing how that issue further impacts diverse populations. Over the last year, we've provided staff trainings on trauma and its impact, LGBTQ plus trainings, use of preferred pronouns, person first language, etc. We display signage that lets clients know they are safe here. Currently, our executive leadership is undergoing diversity and leadership training that will be rolled out to all management and the full staff in the months to come. We support our dreamer by supporting her work with the ACLU to find a pathway to citizenship and by incorporating our diversity into our daily work lives via acceptance and acknowledgement of all religious holidays and practices, as well as accommodation of all religious expression. We have new initiatives in the works and we still have more work to do. We've recent de recently developed a guide team made of staff and consumers to view our premises and our practices from their unique perspectives to assure that we're removing any barriers that exist. Our new Harmony blog will launch in 2022 to be all inclusive and accessible. And we will benefit by connecting and partnering with other agencies doing specific work around social justice and racial justice. All of these actions that we're taking to increase our level of diversity, equity, and inclusion give me hope, but none so much as watching our efforts play out on a personal level such as when a woman came for a job that found a purpose that requires higher education, and she's secure in the knowledge that she'll be supported in that pursuit. Or when an older Caucasian female supervisor sought to expand her understanding of another culture and religion by asking a young African male coworker to explain a bit more about his Muslim religion and traditions. Or when a coworker wrote a beautiful poem of love and support to our young dreamer. Or when I see a coworker experience a loss 
find comfort wrapped in a multicultural hug. This is celebrating the rich cultural her heritage that is harmony. This is the world I want to live in and the company I want to lead. Thank you, Felicia, very much for those opening comments and thoughts and for sharing those personal experiences. Our next panelist this afternoon representing the legal sector is Ellen Capilanti, who is the managing member of Jackson Kelly Law Firm. Ellen? Thank you, and it's truly an honor to be on this panel discussing this issue. Um, I'm my, at our firm, um, we uh, drive diversity inclusion through a very robust committee. Um, the mission, I'd like to share the mission statement of our committee with you. At Jackson Kelly, we value our attorneys' diverse backgrounds, knowledge, and skills, and we believe diversity makes us stronger as a firm. We aim to inspire a culture in which various viewpoints are heard, encouraged, and valued. By each bringing our diverse experiences to work, we strengthen the quality of the service that we provide to our clients, the legal profession, and our communities. When people say why is diversity and inclusion important, besides the fact that it's just morally the right thing to do, um, the science, the research is pretty clear that it creates, leads to better organizations. For example, Diversity increases innovation, creativity, and strategic thinking, and results in better decisions. You attract a better workforce. The stars look for more inclusive companies. There is enhanced employee retention at diverse companies, and being rather self-serving, it's just good for your brand. As a leader, it's not just enough to recruit you have to work harder to retain that diverse workforce. That means creating an environment where opinions are valued. As a leader, it requires continual training and messaging to your workforce about the importance of diversity. And it requires senior management to own it and continually reinforce it. Some of the diversity initiatives we have embarked on, and let me say we're trying, but we have a long way to go. It is very, very difficult to recruit uh, lawyers of color uh, in a lot of the places we have offices. Um, the population is low, and it's just very difficult to uh, encourage people to move into a community where there's not a connection. Um, some of the things we do, um, we mentioned we have a very robust committee. Um, we have had a speaker series. Uh, we've had four of them this year, um, and one of them featured Kitty Dooley, who was absolutely outstanding. And we also have done implicit bias training uh, for our uh, leadership. I want to do it for the whole firm, but it's very hard to do effective implicit bias training by Zoom. It's much better in person, so I'm waiting for that opportunity. Um, we support and sponsor programs that provide opportunities for diverse law students, such as paid summer clerkships, scholarship funds, mentoring programs, and educational programs. Um, our Pittsburgh office hosts a regular diversity speaker series with some of the community's most prominent and diverse profiles, as well as minority law students at both the University of Pittsburgh and Duquesne. Um, we're also very active in the African American Chamber of Commerce in Western Pennsylvania. I'm proud to say that I have made progress in our Pittsburgh office. We have 12 attorneys, six of whom are women and three are black. Uh, and that's, uh, that's taken a lot of work um, to, to get to that level. Throughout our footprint, we support organizations in the legal profession in our communities that promote and encourage diversity and inclusion and assist diverse populations with accessing financial assistance, legal assistance, health care, education, and employment. We, reached, we recently launched an initiative to offer pro bono, cons, pro bono consultation and services to black businesses impacted by COVID-19. Um, a number of other items, but one I'm very proud of is we are pursuing Mansfield diversity certification, uh, mid-sized Mansfield. To, uh, to achieve that, law firms are required to demonstrate an 18-month-long 
progress in increasing diversity in senior recruitment and leadership decisions and consider a minimum of 30% diverse candidates for each of these roles. These include women, attorneys of color, LGBTQ plus attorneys, and attorneys with disabilities. Thank you so much, Ellen. <clears throat> Looks like there are exciting things happening at Jackson and Kelly, one of the largest firms uh, certainly in the state of West Virginia and their operation regionally as she of course mentioned her uh, Pittsburgh office. Uh, our next panelist that we're delighted to have with us is Christy Elliott. She's Senior Vice President and Market President for Truist Bank. Christy? Thank you, Kitty. I'd like to start by acknowledging that I am a white woman here to speak on race matters. And while my profession is male dominated and I've experienced gender bias, I know that it's also a Caucasian dominated field and I do not have the lived experiences that many of our listeners do have. I do have compassion and empathy and recognize that as the market president in Charleston, West Virginia, our capital city, that I have the power to impact meaningful change in regard to hiring, participation in community events, promotions, etc. At Truest, our purpose is to inspire and build better lives and communities. The pursuit of being better is what drives us. Truist is committed to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and not just the words. We boldly believe that we have the power to achieve these things together. At the end of the day, the fundamental belief that everyone and every moment matters is our guiding value. As we look to move from awareness to action, it's a journey and one that most of us are still on, as you've heard from the prior panelists. Unfortunately, racial disparities and inequities have been happening for decades, centuries really. And unwinding this damage takes time, intention, and commitment. In the last three years, diversity, equity, inclusion, or DEI, has gone from pre-awareness to awareness, and now we're in that action stage of the journey. At Truist, our board of directors is 45% racially, ethnically, or gender diverse, and our 14-member executive leadership team has two women and two African-Americans. We've also committed to ongoing pay equity reviews and increasing diversity in our senior leadership and in our community advisory boards, which help drive each individual city throughout the truest footprint. Internally, we've developed eight business resource groups in our market to increase cultural awareness, deliver on our purpose, and foster in inclusivity. We've hosted hundreds of days of understanding sessions where conversations on race and social justice were held. We've also invested in training our leaders to recognize and change unconscious biases and provide inclusion and diverse learning opportunities. We've dedicated our multicultural banking offices within our footprint, one being here on the west side in Charleston, We've also dedicated funding to HBCUs and Hispanic-serving institutions for leadership development, community development projects, student workforce development, and scholarships. Truist has become more intentional about selecting and engaging diverse
me too much power. Okay. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> um, sorry about that. Tourist has uh, also become more intentional about selecting and engaging diverse suppliers who reflect who we are as a community and a company. And, and that's something I, I think all companies are, are starting to look at in terms of uh, who supports the products that, that they uh, purchase. Truist made an initial investment of $40 million to help establish the Corner Square Community Capital. This is a new national nonprofit fund that will support selected community development financial institutions, or CDFIs. 100% of the funding will be allocated to racially and ethnically diverse small business owners, women, and individuals in low and moderate income communities with the focus on African American owned small businesses. As a leader in the financial industry, we recognize the importance of standing together to support, promote, and achieve a diverse and inclusive environment. In 2020, Truist signed PwC's CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion and pledged to advance diversity and inclusion in the workplace. But the work is not complete. Progress has been made and progress will continue as long as we hold one another accountable for our actions or our inactions. I have a lot of hope for the future. I have a lot of hope for Charleston, for West Virginia, and for the country. I have hope because of events like this and leaders like those I'm sharing the stage with today. Together, we will continue the journey to inclusive, equitable communities supporting our diverse population. Christy, thank you very much uh, for, and for sharing uh, Truist's uh, version of Race Matters 2.0 uh, as we talk about uh, what now and what's next. Uh, obviously, that conversation is going on within your organization. Our next panelist is representing the healthcare sector, and that is Craig Glover who is, <coughs> excuse me, CEO of Family Care Health Center. Craig? Thank you, Tom. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you for being invited to this panel discussion to discuss diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, family Care is a uh, full-service, comprehensive community health center providing physical health, behavioral health, and, and dental services. Annually, we serve over 32,000 people. Um, and I would say that we have been in the business of diversity and inclusion in our entire 32 year history. However, recently the board has decided that we should be more uh, directive toward uh, how we want to focus on diversity and equity and inclusion because we realize we serve a diverse community. Um, as healthcare providers, we're used to providing care for all folks. We, we take care of a lot of women. Uh, we have minorities uh, that we're serving. We take care of the LGBTQ community. But it's not enough just to say that this is what you're doing. We really have to be purposeful uh, about it. Um, and that comes through developing a DEI strategy. Uh, as we were completing a recent strategic plan, our board was very, uh, very prescriptive in that we've added this into our structure, uh, into our plan. And as we've heard from some of the previous panelists, um, their DEI means something different to each organization. So. Where we are now in our journey is we're defining what that means for us. What does that mean for us as a healthcare provider? Uh, what does that mean for us in, in serving a diverse community? We want to make sure that we are acknowledging that our community is unique and that people come to us as patients, uh, people come to us as associates, uh, folks that we work with as partners. They all have different uh, unique uh, characteristics and things that they bring to us. So we want to make sure that as we're developing a strategy that we're taking that into account. Uh, our, my board is very clear that uh, DEI is not a cookie cutter thing. We can't take the strategy from another organization and just implement it into our plan. We have to figure out what works for our organization and, and how we can best serve our patients as well as serving our community. So as we're looking at how do we move from action to, or from awareness to action, it really is about being aware um, and understanding that there's lots of diversity and uh, there are different ways that we can approach that. 
So where we're starting is by educating our board about diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, they've attended workshops. We are uh, now working to find other training so that we can begin to develop what our strategy looks like uh, internally. Um, once we develop what DEI means for family care, then we will start to engage our associates in making sure that they understand what our plan is and they understand what we're trying to accomplish uh, as an organization. We still have a long way to go. I would say um, DEI development is a marathon, it's not a sprint, and we are just getting started on our way out of the blocks. So there's a lot of work to do, and it's great to be on this panel and hear from here's some of the ideas and some of the other things that uh, the panelists are implementing. To me, as an African-American uh, leader, it's important because I've been on the other side of being oppressed. I, I know what it's like to be the minority in the room or to be the minority trying to seek services where the other folks uh, not only do they not look like you, but maybe they don't understand some of the challenges that you may have. That's very important as we think about access to healthcare, because as a healthcare organization, as we roll out different strategies, we have to think about how is that going to impact the, the various uh, individuals that we're serving, and understanding that one uh, approach may not be the same for everybody else. And just to give you an example, in the middle of the pandemic, we had to start offering uh, telehealth visits, but we were very aware as we were rolling this out, not everybody has the same access to technology, not everybody has a smartphone, not everybody uh, has internet access at their house. So one of our things of looking at diversity, equity, and particularly the inclusion part of that is making sure that as we're rolling something out, that we're making sure that everybody has the same access to it. Because at the end of the day, we want to be the organization that uh, embraces everybody's uh, unique uh, individualism and that we make sure that everybody feels comfortable with our services. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Craig. Uh, we know that healthcare is really where the rubber meets the road and many times uh, communities that are, 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 are without do not have that and we know that's what you're providing and hope to have some follow-ups for you later uh, about how you're impacting the underserved community as well. Uh, next, we'd like to introduce to you Bob Welch, who's the general manager of Toyota Manufacturing uh, here in West Virginia. Uh, you all have probably seen some of their advertisements and uh, they've invested over a billion dollars in this, a this area and have really a, a payroll that's uh, a quarter of a billion dollars and Bob's going to let us know what they're doing to work through diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Uh, hopefully everybody can hear me okay. Uh, first of all, hello everyone. I'm very honored to be part of this panel and speak with you today about uh, Toyota's interest in uh, diversity and inclusion and why it's important in manufacturing. Um, you know, I can speak at length on this topic. It's a topic I'm very passionate about. And, and we all know that Toyota is as well, as Kitty mentioned. And um, I want to focus on two topics before I get into some of the metrics that, that, that we have to share. Um, you know, why is it important to Toyota? I think, uh, you know, first and foremost, it's the right thing to do. You know, the, the right thing to do is not always the easiest thing to do, and quite often it's not. Um, and on our journey at Toyota locally, and when I speak today, I'm going to be talking about Toyota globally, Toyota in North America and in Toyota locally as well. But for us in, at the West Virginia plant, it's meant uh, holding town halls, meeting with our diverse members, making ourselves vulnerable, having difficult conversations, uh, self-reflection, uh, recognizing biases that exist, and, and perhaps shedding tears on both parts from our diverse members that are sharing their experiences and those of us that have blind spots. Um, but it's, it's a necessary journey for any company that wants to be relevant in today's economy and going forward, we believe. Secondly, uh, I think research has shown over and over that inclusive teams produce the most innovative, the most creative solutions, and also the most robust solutions in problem solving. So when you decode that, that also means the most competitive. And if you're in manufacturing, by default, 
your for competitiveness and then the constant pursuit of competitiveness. It's a never ending journey as well. So at Toyota, one of our guiding principles is respect for people. And uh, because of that, you know, Toyota across all, you know, we have 80,000 employees in North America and in all the sites, uh, we work very hard to create an environment that's uh, welcoming to all. Uh, it's a space to create a space where folks can be comfortable and bring their best self, their whole self to contribute to uh, continuous improvement, which is another core principle of Toyota, and that's continuous improvement of their processes they work on, uh, our products that we provide to our customers, as well as their own self-development. And uh, we're very happy to, to work every day to improve that at, at Toyota West Virginia. So if we talk about a few numbers, uh, I think one of the most visible things we've done in the last few years is the Paralympics. Uh, Paralympics, you know, we've been a very, uh, from a corporate standpoint, a very strong sponsor of that diverse crowd. Uh, we have uh, many business partner groups in all of our locations, and that's uh, groups of underrepresented folks. We have three at the West Virginia plant, which is the African American Collaborative, our Women's Initiative, and uh, our Spectrum, which uh, represents the LBGTQ community at the plant. So n nationally, we've uh, empowered our business partner groups to, so to contribute $475,000 to 48 nonprofits in the last year. We've also partnered as a corporation in North America with 11 HBCUs to uh, give over $110,000 to the United Negro College Fund. Uh, locally, as I mentioned, in addition to the BPG activity, we've had these town hall meetings where we meet face to face and, and allow to share experiences and learn about our own biases, as I mentioned. Um, and we've we've just recently crafted a three-year DNI plan to help us move at our West Virginia plant from one of awareness to advocacy. Thank you, Bob. Thank you very much, and thanks very much to Toyota for all that you do. And and we look forward to exploring some of these ideas a bit further in conversation here this afternoon. Our seventh and final panelist here for our first panel this afternoon represents arts and culture. And that is Joe Tackett, who is president of the West Virginia Symphony Orchestra. Joe? Thank you, Tom. And I want to thank GKVF for being so forward-thinking and involving the arts and culture in this conversation. The West Virginia Symphony Orchestra is the largest employer of artists in the state of West Virginia, as well as the largest performing arts organization in the state. And we have recognized we need to build bridges to increase diversity across every aspect of the organization from the musicians on the stage to the people that attend our concerts and even the decision makers in the boardroom. Spearheaded by board member Sharon Flannery, a Charleston-based attorney with Steptoe and Johnson, we established a diversity, equity, and inclusion committee in July of 2020 and began asking some really uncomfortable questions. To be frank, our orchestra has no black musicians or Latino. Our board had one black board member at the time. Our audience is predominantly white. We had to face the reality of the entire orchestra field that by and large classical music had strategically positioned itself for the enjoyment of one group of people while purposely shutting out or down or ignoring others. When we looked at the music we had performed over our first 80 seasons as a classical music organization, we had performed a total of three works by black composers. There was a lot of work to be done. After establishing the DEI committee, Cindy McGee, our chairperson and a wealth advisor with Buckingham Strategic Wealth, committed to appointing three additional black board members as a short-term goal. Following this, the board has grown more diverse by appointing members from other marginalized communities. We are already seeing the fruits of our labors. With the help of these new voices, we have begun to take looks at our programming about how the organization interacts with the public, and even the makeup of the musicians on the stage. We have committed to ongoing DEI training with our board. We have begun marketing and outreach efforts to specific communities and groups of people that we have often overlooked in our traditional marketing efforts. Making our organization as inclusive as, as possible is now a top priority of the board of directors. Last season, we programmed several pieces by black composers. This season coming up, every concert we play 
will be a piece will be a uh, piece composed or performed by an artist of color will be on the program. We have made deliberate commitments to amplify these un uh, underrepresented and often unheard of vo unheard voices. Last season, our performances of the George Walker lyric for strings was actually our most streamed and viewed piece of music, a wonderful piece of music by a black composer of the 20th century. By the way, just a quick plug. Next Saturday, we will perform the Haydn Cello Concerto with a black soloist, Sterling Elliott, a 19-year-old cellist and a rising superstar in the classical music world, if you'd like to see us in action. He will also make several school and community visits while he's here in Charleston. Perhaps my proudest achievement of what we've done is last season, our annual Young People's Concert. The entire concert, performed right here on this stage, thanks to curator Randall Reed Smith, was an entire program of music of nothing but black composers. It was broadcast and streamed through classrooms throughout the state, and over 16,000 children heard the music by composers who deserve a voice. But many challenges remain. We still need to figure out how to change our musician audition process to be more inclusive and encourage people of color to audition for our orchestra. We have a lot of work to do in building audiences of color, and we need to remain vigilant to not allow these voices to fall into the background again. Our goal is to make composers such as George Walker, Florence Price, William Grant Stills become so common that we think of them only by their last name, such as Mozart, Beethoven, and Bach. Thank you. Joe, thank you so much for that, um, that assessment of the symphony and the things that you're doing to move the whole idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion forward in an area that we may not necessarily think is essential, but I think bringing that to the masses and particularly working with children is so, so important. So thank you for that. Uh, at this time, we're going to have some questions for all of the panelists as we move forward. And uh, we may direct the questions to all of you or whoever believes they're best equipped to respond to the questions can do so. Uh, and so out of the gate, I think I'd like to just, just ask this of the, uh, of the whole. Uh, the, some of the initiatives that you all are discussing uh, are extremely, extremely important. Um, I heard Craig mention uh, including diversity, equity, and inclusion in their strategic plan. Uh, and, and oftentimes, we make changes, but as personnel change, uh, they don't, those changes aren't systemic. And so you have changes today or for the next five years, but in 15 to 20 years, those changes are not in place. And, uh, and, and so that being the case, what are you all doing to ensure that the changes in your organizations are systemic and lasting uh, so that each, um, each team coming in can build upon the work that's been done? And it can be in employment, it can be moving people into mid-management, um, if it's banking, loans to businesses, any idea? Well, Kitty, I'll, I'll start since you kind of gave us a plug. So for us, um, right now, it's putting it into our strategic plan. And uh, from the leadership standpoint, our commitment is we have to report uh, on our full strategic plan, <coughs> pardon me, to our board of directors on a quarterly basis. So therefore, just in that alone, we will be sort of called to the task of um, discussing what we're doing related to diversity, equity, and inclusion. As we develop our plan, I foresee us um, adding things into our employment pra practices, our evaluation practices, and, and other things, how we uh, schedule appointments for patients, and all of those things that will make DEI become part of the fabric of the organization. And, and our ultimate goal, at least from my standpoint, is that we, we get away from discussing the DEI strategy and we just start talking about these are things that we do because it becomes part of the fabric of the organization. Thank you, Craig. Anyone else? Yeah, Kitty, I'd like to expand on Craig's point, and, and I think he's exactly right. One, you have to have a dedicated plan up front to make sure you get on the right path. I think secondly is when you hire and employ and you promote, you must make sure that that diversity and inclusion stay very current. 
So when a, when a group of leadership maybe walks out the door and retires today, the new leadership that comes in, and it's right back to his point, it's not a new plan, it is the plan. And I think that's how you get there, is it has to be just instilled in you as a business. Thanks, Chris. Kitty, I'll, I'll just add a little bit to that. Um, in terms uh, of banking and specific efforts that we're making, not only to um, elevate and, and change the look up of our executive leadership, our mid-management, one of the other things that we're doing is looking to and make sure that we're making deliberate effort to invest in minority-owned businesses and small businesses and making funding, whether um, you know grant funding or, or access to capital, however we might be able to do that, available by meeting the clients where they are, not expecting uh, the clients to, to come in and find us, but going to them in their communities and their businesses and making them aware of some of the opportunities that they have uh, with financial institutions. Okay. Thank you, Christy. I like the use of Christie's word deliberate time and again, because in, in the arts, that's certainly a case too. I know you've got museums now that are taking serious looks at how do we add diverse uh, artists to our, to our museums. You know, the Metropolitan Museum, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the Metropolitan Opera House, uh, for the first time two weeks ago, commissioned and performed an opera by a black composer. But I think it's those kind of deliberate decisions that have to be made by arts organizations that no, we are going to do this to make these voices heard. So thank you for that. So one thing I'll say, um, our format today, we actually have a lot of questions that have been submitted in advance of today's summit from those who are attending today remotely. We have some here in the audience at the Culture Center. Um, and Kitty and I actually have eight pages of questions single spaced in front of us. <laughs> And uh, so there's no way we're going to get all the way through those eight pages, uh, but they are, I would love to actually ask every single one of these questions. They are brilliant questions. Um, but this will give it, hopefully, if, if these questions have come in uh, from in advance, uh, we won't be limited by our format today, which doesn't allow us to take questions during the day through the chat room as we had the chance last year in 2020. But um, wonderful some questions, and, and that's what really Kitty and I are, are keying off of, plus the comments we're hearing from our panelists. So one question that we had from several folks in advance of today is we think about this being Race Matters 2.0 and we're doing what now and what's next, is we're at the early part of a journey. As I hear each of you talk, it strikes me we're at the early part of a journey, but maybe we already have some experience under our belts about what works and what has not worked. And so uh, some of our questioners have asked for a reaction from the panel, comments from the panel. What have you seen that's worked well, worked best, or not worked so well, and you might not do again if you had it to do over? Um, thoughts on that? Well, I, I'll comment. I think it's very hard for anyone to be successful if they're the only person in that office, if you're the only woman, if you're the only person of color. In law, maybe if you're the only person that practices in that um, subject area. So it's really important to be successful that you try to uh, you know, create some critical mass. One person alone, uh, hiring one, one person of color, um, it's very difficult for that person to be successful. It's a great start, but you have to be more intentional and uh, create, like I said, more, more, more critical mass. Thank you, Ellen. Others? Thoughts, comments? Bob? Yeah, Tom, I'll take that. You know, for us, it's uh, involved uh, uh, with the senior leadership all the way down through our, our first level of supervision of, of in Toyota, there's a concept called Genshi Genbutsu, which means go and see for yourself. It's, and in this case, it means, you know, don't assume or, or don't be presumptuous, but, you know, meet with the folks in the diverse groups one-on-one -on -one uh, you know, hear what their experiences are, and, and you'll be uh, amazed, shocked, horrified at the experiences that are going on in your own blind spots if you're part of the dominant culture. And, and when you have that experience, you know, it, it strengthens your team overall. It makes the space more comfortable. Uh, and, and for us, you know, the next part of that journey is, is, is you know, we've got to 
move out of management, if you will, which is a couple hundred of the 2,200 folks out there at our plant, and how do we reach and educate and enlighten you know every single team member that that's working uh, to to get that synergistic you know power of everybody understanding and, and kind of rolling in cadence. So, hey Tom, maybe Chris. maybe expand on that just a little bit. So, one of the things we've learned is if you go and ask, like like you've alluded to, and you do nothing about the feedback that you get, you will not get any more feedback. And we've learned that the hard way, unfortunately. And so you have to ask with intent to listen and learn, but then do something with the feedback you're given. Uh, we've learned that the hard way. Yeah, I, I agree. It's important that from the, from the top, the whole organization knows that this is part of the fabric of our organization. This is what is, there's an acceptable uh, and an unacceptable, and that racism or these practices are unacceptable from the top and then you have to create an environment where people feel safe enough to come forward and that's not going to happen if you're not asking the question and it's certainly not going to happen if you ask the question and then you did nothing so you've got to you've got to create that safe space for people and let them know that this is a priority for every organization thanks felicia others so I heard a few things we you know it's hard to do this solo uh, no so so just a, as a single experience that's not going to work it's going to have a high likelihood of failure so we need to think more broadly uh, meet with one another and meet people where they are you're expanding that now at Toyota more broadly beyond the management team and trying to think about how to roll that out with 2200 of your of your colleagues right team members uh, and then acting on feedback so something that that uh, Chris thanks for sharing something that didn't work and that is soliciting feedback but not acting on it so be prepared to make that commitment and then creating that safe space as I heard your opening remarks Felicia it seemed to me that was all about safe space and that's that's pretty powerful thank you all right next question uh, we know what the demographics are in West Virginia 3% African-American, total minorities maybe around 6%. And if we're making concerted efforts um, to recruit and retain uh, African-Americans, other people of color, insular minorities, what efforts uh, are you undertaking that have allowed you to recruit and retain folks and what ideas do you have that might uh, assist others? And as we look at this, I know there may be some distinctions, uh, particularly Ellen, in, in the law that may be a little different than manufacturing uh, or utility. Uh, but what has worked for you? What are you trying? And what do you look to, how successful do you feel you're being in those efforts? Who'd like to take that first? So Kitty, uh, thanks for the question. One of the things we do when we're trying to recruit doctors to the area, particularly if we're trying to recruit minority doctors, is finding out what's important to them. Uh, is it schools? Is it recreation? Uh, what is it? Um, also, too, making sure that they understand that there are other people here. And I, I can speak from my own uh, experience, having been recruited here two and a half years ago. You know, one of the things I looked for were what are some of the other groups, or are, are there places that I can fit in uh, into this community? So you know, I found that um, there are other folks that I already have a connection to that were here. So I think that's important. Um, and I think also, uh, as we do this, uh, at least in my organization, as we move forward, letting them know that we now have a focused effort on uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. Because I think maybe if it doesn't, we're not quite where we want to be, but they know that we're working on it, um, I think that may also help attract people as well. Thank you, Craig. Who's next? Kitty, I'll add to that that I, I have a unique opportunity right now to be part of a uh, recruiting effort to recruit individuals to live within the city limits of Charleston from a, a, a grant between Charles, the city of Charleston and Charleston Area Alliance. And one of the things that we do through that is look for diversity in our applications or in our applicants and do some of the things that Craig is mentioning, which is find out what they like. Uh, do they, are they interested in dancing? Can we in introduce them, get them connected, have them have a sense of feeling to the community? And I think as organizations that, that represent mostly the private sector here on, on the stage, 
we have the opportunity to invest in programs like this to help with the recruiting effort. So it may not be within our specific companies, but we have the opportunity within our community to make the investments for others that are doing that recruiting for different job sectors. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, Kitty, you're looking at me, so <laughs> I, I think I'm obligated to Please. answer here. And you know, certainly where we're located, you know, in rural Putnam County provides challenges. Uh, you know, we're in the middle of farm fields that are, you know, 17 miles from the interstate, 15 to 17 miles from the interstate, and then you're still, you know, quite a ways from, uh, you know, where the nucleus of, of some of our diverse uh, population lives. So, you know, we, we've we been, uh, we, our numbers don't match what they want to be, what we want them to be from both a, uh, a gender uh, and certainly from the, uh, you know, the 3% of the community that's African American either. And, you know, so, and we've been around about almost, uh, you know, 23 years and uh, ha haven't fixed it yet. Uh, but, you know, we really, I think, Toyota's good at problem solving and using data to drive that. So most recently, we've actually brought in folks that, you know, are, are that are of females and, and are diverse um, team members and, and polled them on, you know, what are obstacles, you know, of course, once we lose somebody, we've kind of lost the information. So we we try to do that in any in exit interviews. But you know we're uh, meeting with with folks uh, in the diverse uh, community and, and trying to understand what those obstacles are, which are you know child care may be one for for uh, both of those groups, and you know trying to craft plans. How can we remedy that? Uh, and then we also realize you know a lot of folks don't even know that Toyota exists. You know we. Charleston and Huntington, you know, 30 minutes away, but, you know, so we're, we're, we realize we need to get involved at our, in, in the schools, you know, elementary schools and middle schools, and we're crafting plans to, to create, a, you know, programs uh, in the future that'll uh, perhaps as you get into high school even to, to, you know, do some shared school and work uh, to, to be job ready upon graduation. Thank you, Bob. I think that's interesting that you mentioned the schools. Uh, not just for manufacturing, but for, for all areas, so that children are aware of the opportunities. And maybe they'll prepare themselves, uh, whether it's vocationally or uh, continuing to college, uh, but that's a, that's a very good point. Mm -hmm. And if I can just add, you know, we realize, you know, uh, those of you that have you know, high school age children, or, you know, you realize one, once you get to high school, it's a little bit late, so, you know, we, we've got to develop that interest and show a path, uh, you know, in elementary, late elementary or middle school to, hey, you, you know, you don't have to go to university, for example, you can, you know, if you want to do a craft or, you know, you want to work in production, it's, it's uh, you know, very interesting work as well. Well, that's good to know. And hopefully some of the folks who are listening at home, that gives them an idea. Um, maybe you'll get some folks knocking on your door. That's good. <laughs> Absolutely. So. Kitty, I want to expand on that. We are all, we've identified that also that um, we offer no different than Toyota. We offer careers, not jobs. And for whatever reason, folks still don't attract to you. They either don't know about you, don't know who you are, don't know where you are. And so we've also found you have to start that recruiting in the middle schools is where it has to start. You have to offer, we're offering paid internships for high schoolers now. And we're offering paid internships for uh, folks that are in either technical schools or four year schools. Because we need all we need all of the above, right, to fill the roles that we have. But we have learned that you have to be an active recruiter to your company. They will not come to you. You have to go show them what you offer, why it's a good place to work, why it's the right culture to work in. And when you do that, you'll get the folks you need. All right. Anyone else? Yeah, I agree. Um, you know, as I would struggle to to fill the need that we have and the gaps that we have trying to serve our mission. Uh, across particularly rural West Virginia, and I would express that frustration of the workforce just isn't there, um, and what might be there might not be willing to make the adjustments they need to make to embrace a different way of thinking and different way of practicing. Uh, and you know, my daughter said, if we, you know, we have to grow it, so we have to go out, we have to go to to. In, in this case, you can go to you know predominantly black colleges or reach out to. Uh, education facilities that um, that are pr predominantly or have a large minority population 
and make sure that you market your product to them, make sure they understand that there's a place for you, offer those paid insurance internships, um, allow, you know, from starting in middle school for kids to come and see what it is that you do so they can choose a career path. Um, but you also need to make it attractive to them and, and make sure that they see themselves reflected in your population uh, as much as possible. So. Thank you for that. And, and your comments, uh, are, I believe, are so helpful for folks who may be seeking employment but not know. And of course, uh, Felicia, I think you make an excellent point, but in West Virginia, I mean, you've got to get folks in the door and employed. And if you come in and you don't see someone who looks like you, you be the first or the second and say, we won't be the last. Because it, it, all too often, folks will come in and then, as, as Ellen said, they may not be totally comfortable, but we've got to be able to build critical mass. So if they can get support from the organizations, uh, then also, uh, maybe we can start to see the numbers increase. Well, y you know, when I started Harmony, obviously, it, you know, it's a family-owned business. It, we're uh, mental health professionals, but we're, we're African Americans. And so, but when I started Harmony, we started to grow. I hired, you know, everyone that I gave birth to. I hired everyone that I knew. <laughs> and then I hired everyone that they knew. And then eventually, I ran out of people. <laughs> and that was where it got scary, because we didn't know what we were getting into. Um, but it's important to then ask those people that you bring in, what is it going to take to attract more people like you uh, into our field? Excellent point. I think also you need to design a job that they're going to feel impactful. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes if you can just get them to come visit your business, right? Mm -hmm. if, if you can just get them there, um, they, can, they can see that this is a place they can be comfortable. But sometimes just getting them to to travel to yeah. some of the places that we all are located is uh, a challenge. But I like what you said. I think in the past, especially in the law profession, folks were always open to hiring diverse people, but they waited. We waited for the diverse candidates to come to us um, instead of proactively um, seeking them out. And I think that's the biggest change I've observed uh, with us and, and also you know, other folks in the profession that, that we're just not waiting. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Kitty. Um, great discussion. So um, one question that came from several of our audience members in advance of today's session, I want to put to our panelists, um, and that is, did you meet with resistance? Each of you has talked about uh, it rolling out DEI initiatives. Did you meet with resistance in your organization? And if so, how did you overcome it or address it? We absolutely did, and uh, which is interesting because we are an African American organization, but we have you know a, a, a base of, of Caucasian employees, and their discomfort in addressing any of these issues was uh, palpable, and so there came a point where we had to, we did what we could to raise awareness, to raise understanding, rate, and raise the issue that this is core to who we are as a company. You know, I have an opening speech that I give everybody that I hire. This is a black, female-owned social justice organization that serves people who are victims of crime, people who have experienced interpersonal violence, domestic violence, sexual assault. If you have a problem with any of that that I just said, this is not the place for you. And they come on, and then they find out that they do have a problem with one or more of the things that I've said. And so it's important um, that you decide to go forward anyway, even when it's uncomfortable. And the people who can't adjust, the people who can't feel comfortable, learn, experience other people, other cultures, and understand what richness that adds to their lives, then they may, may make the, the decision to move on. And that's okay. It feels like failure, but it really isn't. It's really creating the organization that you want uh, to reflect and that you want your clients to see and be comfortable in. Thanks, Felicia. Others? I would say at the symphony, uh, surprise, I, I've been very happily surprised that we have a board of directors that has embraced the idea of DEI totally. And uh, we have audience members that have been very uh, responsive to the new programming that we've done as well. 
Uh, the musicians individually also have expressed great interest in it. Uh, but one of the roadblocks that we hit uh, often is uh, we are actually are a unionized uh, organization. And so while our individual musicians, I think, really embrace this idea of ex expanding our audiences, expanding our programming, the, the union and our CBA and our contract uh, is, is a little bit of a, a brick wall for us to, to hit as far as trying to uh, bring in new vo uh, faces and voices. We uh, did an anonymous survey after uh, s uh, several of our presentations because no one's going to uh, say often what they think on the record. And I only got one pretty negative uh, comment um, about the effort. And I thought it was just, um, just, a, just a poor comment, but it was very devastating. Uh, to a couple of our uh, 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 black attorneys that are on the, the, the diversity committee. And um, I think that's, a, I, I'm really interested, and I'm going to reach out to you all about your listening, uh, how, you, how you set those up so people feel comfortable, um, because I think that would be, that's something we really haven't done, and um, I think it would be a really worthy exercise um, in most organizations. Thank Tommy. you, Ellen Joe. Yes, go ahead, Christy. Truest, when, when we started our day of understanding, I encouraged each of my, my team members to enroll and then offered up the opportunity for us to have a discussion. And during that particular time, no one on the team took advantage of that opportunity to discuss. And I was... Um, I was pretty disappointed, to, to say the least, because I, I really wanted uh, my, my teammates to, to be open and, and have a conversation amongst our small team. What I found out, though, is each of them signed up individually for a day of understanding, and, and they weren't on there with people that they see each and every day, but got to hear stories throughout our company. And it was after that that we all came together and had a productive conversation. So I, I think there was uh, some hesitancy at first uh, to, to talk amongst those that you see every day. But what I found was once they heard the stories and heard stories from people that they didn't see, they really had eye-opening experiences and, and it was very touching. That's great. So stories are very powerful. Uh, we're, taught, we're, we're taught as lawyers to tell stories, right? That's how we convey and retain information. And I think that's a really interesting to think about. You really opened up uh, the engagement through hearing stories. And Bob, I recall you saying earlier that you had some real heart to hearts and tears in some of those discussions early on, which it sounds like that advanced the ball. Yeah. You know, for us, the, we, we call it a town hall, but it, you know, it's a you know, maybe in the largest room that we have at the at the plant there, and uh, you know, a group of leaders and a, a group of uh, diverse candidates, and you got to set the ground rules. Hey, it's you know, this is comfortable space. You know, just respect for people both ways, and uh, share. And you know, it's really moving. Uh, and then you know, I mentioned the business partner group. So we have uh, like three groups: uh, a women's group. Uh, uh, the LBGT group, which is Spectrum, and the African American Collaborative. But we also have young professionals, group, some groups that aren't underrepresented. There's a young professionals group, a veterans group, and uh, a Toyota Christian Fellowship group. And, you know, those groups collaboratively work together on, on outside uh, activities. And, you know, that's been a good dynamic for us, uh, the business partner groups. Um, and and corporate-wide, we even, you know, in, in the areas that, that have uh, – a large Latino representation or Hispanic representation. There's a business partner group for that as well. So that's been a powerful tool, and also just individually reverse mentoring is something that I that I participate in. Where, you know, I meet with a uh, uh, African American individual on a, on a weekly basis, and it's really just you know sharing, uh, you know, some work related items, but more it's just a free space of of bouncing things off of each other and helping. And that you know that. For us in the last year and a half, really, you know, we kind of hit a critical mass uh, with the, uh, you know, the George Floyd, the Ahmaud Aubrey, and the Breonna Taylor, the cadence of those atrocities happening in such a short period of time. Uh, it was a bowling over point for, even though we don't have a heavy representation of African-American uh, uh, 
uh, folks at our plant, team members at our plant, it, it was enough critical mass to, to you know, calls come forward. And, you know, a lot of us had blind spots and, and didn't really realize, uh, you know, the pain that, that was going on, quite honestly. So in that year and a half, you know, what, what started as uncomfortable conversations really aren't that uncomfortable anymore. At, at a time, uh, at, in the beginning, you know, there was a cloud always, maybe for the last 20 years, or a burden on, on those folks' shoulders all the time that some of us weren't aware of. But, you know, now our awareness is, is uh, increased and we're, you know, on the road to advocacy and moving from bystanding to upstanding, that, that kind of thing. You know, so it's a long journey, but we feel like we're, you know, moving forward on it. Thank you, Bob. Kitty? All right. Thank you, Tom. Um, I want to delve into this just a little bit more, and this is one of the questions that we received. Um, and those of you who are on this panel, uh, from the comments you've made and some of the initiatives that you've taken in your company, you get it. But you are at the highest levels of the corporation. And sometimes, even with the best leadership, the highest levels uh, don't necessarily trickle down to mid and even some of the upper management and, and maybe the line workers don't get the idea that there's this understanding. And so how do you educate the folks who are the lower or mid managers so that their employees know that this is an important uh, initiative of the company uh, and that the work that they're doing is important. I mean, how are you educating those people? And this goes back to ensuring that those uh, initiatives and the corporate culture that embraces diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, is felt throughout the organization. Maybe I'll jump right on that one again. Sorry to, to, to. Please. Um, you know, so I mentioned a few things. But we also, those town halls, once we did them at the senior level, we saw how powerful it was. And, and luckily, our team members were willing to, you know, go through that pain time and time again and share it in person as we moved down to even the first level of supervision. So that was very powerful uh, for us as well. And then one thing we do, uh, you know, at the, at the supervisory level, the, the managers above them will we'll pick a book, uh, you know, one of like Steve Robbins has a couple of books that have just little short stories, almost equivalent to like a Sunday school lesson, if you will, uh, to put it in context. And you'll sign somebody to lead in your team and, you know, everybody will read it for this week and then you'll meet and let that person facilitate conversation of, you know, wh what did you see in this? And then other folks will see something else and that, you know, w once you do some of that, it just starts to become more comfortable to talk about topics that maybe a few years ago were just, you don't talk about that at work, you know, so that, that's what's working in our case so far. All right. Kitty. Thanks, Bob. Anyone else? Kitty, with lawyers, you need to bring somebody else from outside. <laughs> 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 uh, that's what's really been effective is bringing in uh, uh, some national speakers, you know, uh, to uh, you and, uh, and three other people from across the country so they can hear from somebody else besides me. And it's a lot of repetition, but not so much that they start tuning it out. Um, but it's all about telling interesting stories. And I think um, that, that seems to be what works best for us. For Harmony, now we're much smaller, <laughs> much, much smaller um, than uh, many of you here. But uh, we recently, in August, we did an all-staff retreat uh, where we took our staff off uh, premise to Ogilvy Resort, and we, f we were focused on some particular initiatives, self-care, just coming out of everything we had been through. And uh, our staff dealing with not just the, the, the normal traumas that they deal with in serving their clients, but then the added layer of the pandemic on top of everything that's going on in their own personal lives. So, um, so we did the staff retreat, and one of the things that we did there was a uh, blind privilege walk. Um, and we did that to remove any kind of shame from it so that no one saw what people were responding to. Uh, when they removed their blindfold, they only saw where people landed, where they ended up. So they don't know what got them there, but they, know, they knew um, where they landed. And that did a lot to, um, to remove some assumptions um, about what privileges people have. We know we all share some, some sort of privilege. Um, 
And so it both ways from uh, people of color and people who, uh, uh, who were not, uh, it removed a lot of assumptions about what privilege they may or may not have enjoyed. Um, and so that helped a lot. We also needed, because we are a, uh, you know, our leadership is not only um, a minority, not only are we uh, uh, African Americans, but we're also family. And so for people to feel comfortable, how do you go complain about somebody when that might be, you know, the child of or the uncle of or the whatever? Um, um, so how do you say, you know, I'm having, a, I'm struggling with this uh, and feel comfortable with that? And the way that we did that is that we linked um, to our board. And so we have members of our board where if there's a topic that they feel like, or they've gone through the processes and feel, you know, like the situation hasn't been resolved, they feel unheard, they can um, go bring it directly to our board member. And so our board was present in that all staff retreat, which was really critical to understand that these are things, these are initiatives, and these are things that are important to us, that they're important to us. Um, it's, but this is important to our culture from the top down. Uh, Kitty, one of the things we, we've learned is we're a very large organization spread out all over. And so one of the things that we learned is we actually came up with, uh, with diversity and inclusion liaisons. So these are frontline folks that help lead your effort. Um, and the reason we did that and found success in that is there's trust built with these folks locally. They know the work environment and the folks that are trying to get the work done. They kind of understand the, the trials, maybe, and tribulations that they're trying to go through on a daily basis. And we found that's been very successful for us to use them to help us in getting the message out and how to, uh, how to basically improve in what we're trying to do. Well, what I hear you all, is anybody, oh, Craig? Oh, I, I wanted to add one point if I can. Um, and I, I think to summarize what all the other panelists said, it's about showing value to the individual. So, I mean, it can start at the top that we're going to do this because this is the right thing to do, but you have to be able to take that strategy, break it down into smaller pieces, and then show that individual that there is value to you by doing this work. And I think that's really how you get the buy-in, and you can start to wade through some of the, maybe some of the pushback you may get. Well, I think it's important that, that we've heard that it has started at the top but it has not stayed there. That it's filtered down to smaller groups to get down to line workers uh, and even, uh, you know, police in your organization, there's a mechanism to ensure that what happens at the top continues to, uh, to be the, the corporate policy when you get down to the line uh, employees. And I think that's, that's very important. Thank you all for that. Thanks, Kitty. I'm interested in learning more about this blind privilege walk, so we'll have to talk about that later. Oh, so uh, that, that sounds like an interesting exercise. Joe, one of the comments you made about the collective bargaining agreement uh, triggered a question. It really led me to a question that one it has been posed from one of our audience members, uh, and that relates to the question of policy and policies. And so have, it, have you changed policies in your organization as you've attempted to move the needle on this issue? And kind of a related question, how much of this is policy versus culture? Uh, maybe a little bit of both, but just share your experiences regarding policies either to promote or policies that, have, that maybe pr inhibit uh, you know, some of the things that you're trying to achieve and that you've had to change. Well, I certainly think that uh, when we go to renegotiate our collective bargaining agreement next year, this topic of DEI will be a, a major part of the conversation. And uh, I think the, the musicians will be expecting that as well because uh, we, we've got to find a way to, to change the culture. And I, I think they're accepting of that, but I think the national union is going to provide some, some real roadblocks. So uh, we'll have to tackle that as we go along. But um, as, as I, Craig has indicated with their strategic plan, everything else, as us as an organization, we have changed policies, we have changed strategic plan, we've changed our mission statement, and uh, kind of the next step of that is, is bringing the musicians and the unionized labor along with us. That's great. And any, any, were any of those policies particularly impactful that you changed or adopted or the vision uh, strategic plan? I think more than anything else, it has been the change of programming and as an organization because it has changed every facet of, of how we do things. And, you know, down to such little things that nobody thinks about outside of what we do. But, you know, for us to program music by 
black composers. We didn't have those in our library, so we had to purchase music by black composers. And now we own those forever, and they'll sit on our shelves, and so they're available to us to play in perpetuity. So um, it, it, it's been an exciting process, but there's a long way to go. Thank you. Others? Chris? Uh, Tom, we had one that, that when it was first brought up to me, I thought, well, this makes all the sense in the world, and it was amazing, the pushback that was originally put up. But So we created, in, as part of inclusion, a multicultural holiday. And so in our company, Good Friday was a standard holiday. Everyone received Good Friday as a day off, basically. They've converted that holiday now to a multicultural holiday. So you can take Good Friday off if you so choose. But if there's another holiday that, that it means more to you than Good Friday, you take that holiday off. Um, that was a big step for our company. Um, and I, I think that's certainly a step in the right direction for us. So if I understand, is that a floating holiday, meaning different people are taking different days off? Yes, sir. And, but that's their multicultural holiday. Yep. And that made it, wow, interesting. Yep. Others? Felicia? Um, we're, we're doing something similar to that, and just it's, it's just about not determining what is a holiday for other people and saying it has to be Christian-centric um, and allowing people to use their time and that time off. Uh, how best serves them and, and their uh, their needs in terms of their faith. Um, Thank you. Ellen? Well, with the um, mid-sized Mansfield certification, and we only started it about a month ago, you really have to uh, track all your efforts. And I think that we've always been a little more anecdotal um, than data-driven. So, um, you know, typically for some leadership positions, you know, you kind of think, well, that person would be good. You know, now you need to post them. You need to make them available. If you're going to have a practice group leader or someone who's going to be the head of an office, you need to make um, the opportunity available to everybody within reason uh, instead of just picking somebody who seems like the, the usual, usual uh, choice. And another thing it does, which is one thing we don't typically think of, it's not just about leadership. It's about who you go to send to pitch a client. And... Um, I don't know that people keep track of that kind of data, so I think I think that'll be um, I think that'll be really good too. Um, I think our clients have really um, been the been the ones to really move things by making um, lawyers and law firms accountable about how they staff cases. And you really need you know with change, you really do need an external change agent and. Um, that's what uh, our, uh, I think our clients are doing to our profession, which I think is just a really wonderful step. Thank you, Ellen. Others? Policies? Christy. I don't think that it was a, a true policy, because I, to say policy would imply that it would be written. Um, but I do think a, a lot to Ellen's point, we have been very conscious of um, how we are promoting, how we are considering individuals to, to move up in the organization, and knowing that we need to get um, a more diverse senior leadership team, it doesn't mean that, that we can just immediately flip the switch to do that, because there are skills, but we have been intentional of elevating uh, people of color into those positions so that the next time there's an opening, that we'll be able to elevate. So it's not a, a written policy that we've changed, but it's definitely something that we have been uh, aware of and are making diligent changes to. Thank you, Chrissy. Certainly process changes, I think, fall into the, the category of policy for purposes of this question. That's great. So it sounds like there have been policy changes that have been made, uh, and, and including um, a couple of them, posting of positions, process, getting client-facing teams, and being very intentional about diversity as we think about all of those issues. Um, thank you. Kitty? Yes, I like that word intentional. Uh, we must be intentional in order for these changes to be made. Uh, Craig, I want to come back to you. Um, because health care is so essential to most people's lives, uh, and we read studies that suggest that uh, implicit bias results in uh, health care for African Americans and other insular minorities that is not uh, as good or not the same as which is provided to uh, Caucasian individuals. 
And so I want to start with that question, you know, how do you work with your physicians or nurse practitioners uh, to ensure that there's no implicit bias uh, in the care? And maybe we could circle back and generally as you look at management and maybe there are uh, personnel evaluations, how do you kind of ensure that implicit bias doesn't impact how uh, employees are seen and uh, their opportunities for inv advancement within your organization? Um, Thank you for the question. That's a really difficult thing to address because it is implicit bias and sometimes people are doing things and they're not really aware of uh, how they may be responding to, to someone. So we have offered training uh, in the past, but as we look at developing our strategy, that's something that we have to consider um, and how, how we can best uh, address that. Um, I don't really have an answer for you right at the, the moment uh, about it, but I agree with you. There are studies, there, there are lots of studies that show because of implicit bias that there's definitely a dichotomy in the care based on race. I mean, we have to figure out how to, we, uh, the proverbial we, you know, those of us who work in healthcare and provide services, we have to figure out how we can address that and, and overcome those things. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? I think you need to do the training um, because I think until you go through implicit bias training, you just you just have no idea what you've been missing. Uh, I mean, I, I think it's probably the most eye-opening thing I've done in, in recent years. So, Chris? Kitty, one of the things we've done is all of our hiring managers have been through implicit bias training. The other thing we've done is uh, no single individual can determine a hire any longer. It's a diverse panel that you must go through to make a hire, uh, and that's done on purpose. So uh, I think we're getting better results because of that, uh, but it's still a little early yet, so. Well, well, thank you all for that. Anyone else? Uh, I, I think implicit bias training um, is important for awareness, uh, but, but just the training in and of itself doesn't necessarily break down those, those biases because we're all reluctant to uh, believe that we have those. Chris, I love the idea of the things that you're doing, not one person making the hiring decision. Uh, and, and because of that, there can be some discussion. And with the training that you're having um, with diversity, equity, and inclusion, hopefully that's something that others can do to, to address those issues regarding uh, implicit bias. Thank you. Thanks, Kitty. Um, so we've had a good discussion about awareness and training, um, including implicit bias. Uh, one question that's come to us is an interesting one to me, and that is uh, personal to you. What have you done to educate yourself on racial differences, ethnic differences? Uh, what's been most significant? Ellen, you just talked about the implicit bias training, but uh, how, how do you go about educating yourself as the leader of your organization? Tom, I'll, I'll take that. I, uh, in 2018, uh, was approached to uh, help start the um, YWCA's Over the Edge initiative that, that we were able to do in uh, 2019 and was very excited. I got to work alongside Kitty and, and literally repel from the side of my building and you uh, did it go was, over the edge that I, was, just, that I, was burning I, question I in my mind literally right went okay. over the edge okay. um, <laughs> what an experience but um, you know I, I was very excited to lead that initiative and, and to have the support at BBNT at the time truest now um, to to do that because um, you know diversity and inclusion were so important and I felt at that time, you know, I've, I've got this. I, I understand it, and, and I know what to do. And I went through that process and realized I didn't know anything. I, I didn't know anything at all about um, how to be an ally. And just like Ellen said, attending, um, you know, the implicit bias training is so good. And, and I had the... Uh, pleasure of attending it, facilitated by Kitty, a and she says, you know, I know that a lot of you in this room are women, and, and women in business have their own issues. Throw that out the door, because that's not what we're here to talk about today. 
And through that and just talking with individuals, I was able to recognize the privilege, the personal privilege that I had of just being born in America with light skin um, and what that meant to me and hopefully be able to be a better ally, to be able to have conversations, hard conversations, not fun conversations about reactions, about social media posts, um, j just different things. And I lost a few friends or so-called friends through the process. Uh, but someone very close to me said, you know, what you lose, you will gain back twofold. And that's been true because I've been able to have personal experiences understanding others at a much deeper level. And, and I think um, it's important for us personally as leaders to go through uh, these processes and be able to be open and vulnerable with others about personal uh, things we may have done in the past that we're not proud of. Um, because just as we heard in the opening remarks, you know, now that we know better, we have to do better. And um, that's, that's been my personal experience over the last year. Thanks, Thanks Christy, for going. Go ahead, Craig. I'm oh, sorry. Um, and just to add on to what, she's, uh, what Christy has to say, uh, one is, uh, to me, it's a lifelong thing. So, I mean, you can live 100 years and you'll never completely fully understand uh, this. And even as an African American, uh, when I talk to other people, they've experienced things that I've never thought would exist um, and I haven't experienced. And, and so I'm learning from them. So part of it is just being aware of, of what, what's occurring around you and opening your eyes to that. I'm taking advantage of different training. And, um, and as Felicia mentioned, I, I did one of those uh, walks years ago. And it's interesting when you get to the end uh, where people are. But then, you know, again, finding out some things. Like, for example, I did that years ago. I found out that African American women have issues buying pantyhose. I, I don't buy pantyhose, uh, but to, to realize that that's something that they struggle with. Um, that's what I mean is like you have to really become a lifelong student of this and making sure that you're, you're learning and taking what you're learning and then implementing that uh, in a way that's meaningful. Thank you, Craig. Others? Tom, Chris? One, one of the things I've learned is, is to consume your, your news and your information from a credible source. <laughs> um, to turn the TV off. Exactly. Find out who the folks are that are experts in the field. Read from them. Talk with them. Learn from them and be willing to learn. I think you're exactly right. This is a lifelong learning, and I've started way behind in this process. So, Thank you, Chris. So getting news from a credible source and lifelong journey, uh, Craig, for sure. Uh, Christy, thanks for going over the edge and for being open and vulnerable with us. Obviously, you're living, living it and walking the walk. Other thoughts about your person, how you personally educate yourselves? All right, I hear none. Kitty, back to you. This is probably, uh, well, it is uh, more of a personal question. Uh, and it, it goes to uh, what Christy was talking about in terms of the employment um, arena and being an ally. And, and this, this may be more personal of what some of you have experienced. Uh, one of the things that we discuss uh, when we, we have the uh, diversity training is the fact that uh, if, if you're a Caucasian, then most of the time you're in the company of people who look like you. Uh, and in West Virginia, that could be the s same for African Americans. But sometimes there are conversations that are had in that environment um, that doesn't put others, quote unquote, uh, in the best light. And so, what I'd like to know is when you're in that environment, whether it's in a workplace or in a personal environment, uh, how do you respond to those situations based on what you know now? I certainly feel more empowered to call people out than, than even a couple years ago. I, I feel more comfortable saying to people that something's not appropriate not just as a boss, but even colleagues or, or, or whomever. So I guess that's a plus. Absolutely. 
I'll just add me too to that because I do think that the Me Too movement helped us um, all feel more confident in standing up and, and speaking out. Uh, not long ago, I, I actually had a client uh, who made a, an inappropriate comment and I was just candid and said, that's inappropriate and I'm no longer going to be able to work with you because it, it's inappropriate and we cannot stand for it. Thank so, you for that. K Kitty, one thing. If, if you hear something and say nothing, you condone it, which means you support it. You're complicit. Yeah, that's right. You have to say something. Well, I appreciate that, and I believe we get, we're we getting the uh, the time signal. <laughs> this, <laughs> it looks like the full hook. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Todd. Uh, this has just been outstanding. Thank you all for being with us for your truthful and candid uh, discussion. Uh, it's been outstanding. Tom, great to be with you as always. You too, Kitty, and thanks to all of our panelists for sharing your knowledge, experience in such a, such a powerful and effective fashion. We really appreciate it. All right, we're going to go on a brief break, and uh, we'll be back here in a few minutes with those who, who are with us by video on the, in the audience. Thank you so much. <laughs>